How's it going guys? My name is Graham and welcome to Two Left Thumbs. Today I want to talk to you about Diablo 2. Specifically, the first 30 to 60 minutes of Diablo 2. This is something I've been aware of since I was a wee little boy playing this game back in the year 2000, but it was something I always just had a vague sense of and never knew how to put it into words. As I've gotten older, thought about it more, and grown a deeper appreciation for game design, I started to form a very strong opinion, and that is that the first hour of this game might actually be perfect. There's a bit of bias here because Diablo is one of my all-time favorite franchises. I've played all of the games many times over and have had countless hours of fun with each and every one of them. But my absolute favorite thing out of all three games and their expansions is starting a new character in Diablo 2. For the first 30 plus minutes of the game, everything about the setting, tone, action, characters, plot, rewards, gameplay, music, sound effects, everything is executed perfectly. Now, I was concerned that maybe I was nostalgia tripping a little too hard, so I booted up the absolute base vanilla game No Lord of Destruction expansion and played through the first 30 plus minutes with every character. There's a few minor concessions I could make, acknowledging that the game is 20 years old. There's a few quality of life issues. Having to manually pick up gold and the potion management were both vastly improved in Diablo 3. And using the various F keys to manage your skills can be a little clunky. If you can forgive those small artifacts of an old game, then I think you'll follow along well with the rest of this video. Starting from the campfire character selection screen, where each character patiently awaits our attention. Highlighting a character has them step into the light, putting forward a display of might, enticing us to play as them. These quick glimpses are all distinct, memorable, and communicate a great deal about the character in only a few short seconds. We also see most of the characters in more formidable appearances than what we actually start as, showing us an early example of what we will be working towards, what our ultimate version of the character could become. It also provides us a nice reference point visually. The in-game renders are incredibly well made, but are obviously rather limited. Will you play as the Amazon, nimble yet powerful, striking with lightning quick stabs of the javelin, or fighting from a distance with a ranged build? The Necromancer, cunning and twisted, a man who has committed his soul to the dark arts, bending fiendish creations to his wicked will. The Barbarian, proud and mighty, never shying from danger, ready to cleave any foe in two with his uncontrollable rage. The Sorceress, mystical and unassuming who holds a mastery over the elemental arts, blazing enemies in deadly infernos, freezing them in their tracks, or ending their life with a pulse of electricity. Or the paladin, unwavering and holy, one who many view as a savior both from the monsters of hell and of their sinful spirits, using the light of the heavens to aid him in a way that no other can. Each character is readily distinct in these opening moments, a fact that will become abundantly clear each time you pick up and play the game as a new class. With the freedom to completely customize your attribute points, a wide variety of skills, and an incredible loot system that generates near infinite outputs, the game is endlessly replayable. Now honestly for the sake of this I can take or leave the opening cinematic. It provides some intrigue and context for happenings later on in the game, but it hasn't aged particularly well and doesn't do much to explain our personal journey. If or when they do a remaster, I would love to see the Diablo 3 style personalized intro between this cinematic and the actual game starting, give our character a little flavor, some personal stakes in the story. As the quickest overview, through this opening scene we learn of Marius, a frail vagrant whose body and mind have been destroyed by his experiences. We see his torment, guilt, and suffering through his confessions to the Archangel Tyrael, as well as his compulsion to follow a man known only as the Dark Wanderer, an evil man who's eventually revealed to be the fallen warrior of Diablo 1. Roughly one year after the events of the first game, with his failure to contain the Soul Stone, he has become fully corrupted by Diablo's evil. The Early Game our introduction to Diablo 2 and its world are brief and effective. I've played dozens of RPGs that take an hour just to meet the characters of the town and begin your first quest, as is befitting of a series that pioneered the modern idea of an action RPG. We are given the bare minimum needed for a compelling story and setting, and are left to wreak our brutal form of justice across the plains of eastern Kanduris, a short ways from Tristram. Diablo 1 had the horrors of a ravaged town and the tempting terrors of the fallen cathedral on its outskirts. We knew our goal was to fight downwards to defeat Diablo in Hell. I believe a similar concept wouldn't have worked well for a sequel. The once compelling idea of dungeon diving to fight an inevitable foe would have felt like a rehash. Instead, we are staged in the open, vulnerable rogue encampment, built from pitched tents, makeshift walls, and spiked barricades. If you inspect your inventory, you will see that you carry as close to nothing as is possible. Resources at camp are few, morale is low, and the threat of doom is apparent. 
The Rogue Encampment theme music is a beautiful piece that encapsulates everything great about the Diablo franchise. The slow strings, deep, heartbeat-like drums, and eerie plucks and trickles all evoke dread, sapping any feeling of confidence we may have had coming off of the original game. The rules have changed, and we're going to have to adapt. The classical guitar strums that made the Diablo 1 soundtrack famous are present, providing some familiarity. Immediately, the soundtrack is bleak, chilling, yet with a compelling mysticism. There is no sense of hope or adventure to be felt or heard. Speaking to Wariv, we know that Tristram has fallen and that Diablo has possibly been freed. The Dark Wanderer, seen in the opening cinematic, is a mysterious figure who has already passed through the encampment among many other failed adventurers. There are suspicions, but the townsfolk are completely unaware of their brush with the Lord of Terror. Wariv offers to take you on his travels if you survive, a seemingly unlikely prospect in these times. Through Akara, we learn that this encampment is the last holdout of the Rogue Sisterhood, with the Demoness and Dariel corrupting many rogues and slaying more. Their situation is dire and their need for help desperate. With limited defenses, the persistent threat of minor demons and undead beings on the outskirts of their camp have shaken them to the core. While they are grateful for the help, the members of the camp have little reason to hold out hope, and they rightfully don't have a lot of faith in you. Leaving the Camp Staging the game in a sprawling, open-aired setting will be jarring for returning players. It is strange and unfamiliar. What is the state of the world if these horrors are no longer confined to the depths? This camp is not tucked away as a safe haven, but it is instead on the edge of immediate danger. As we leave the camp with barely a shirt on our back, we set foot into the Blood Moor. Despite our clear disadvantages and the shattered state of the encampment, we barrel out into the wilderness with a cocky warning to all those who stand in our way. Beware, foul demons and beasts. All who oppose me, beware. Evil beware. I shall purge this land of the shadow. I will cleanse this wilderness. The members of the camp may not have much faith in us, but they've yet to see what we can do. Upon leaving camp, we're provided with a new song, Wilderness. An eight-minute track of modest composition that solidifies the tension of this game and contributes to one of the greatest video game soundtracks ever made. This song and the soundtrack as a whole are daring, experimental, and evocative. Wilderness alone could be considered a masterpiece, but within the context of the game, it's given that much more weight. A haunting wind blows in alongside a classical guitar. The pounding drums provide the first sense of energy and momentum to this game. We are marching through the horrors of the world as a steadfast hero on an isolating quest against hell itself. The ambiance through this track is unholy and depressing. There is an angelic choir supporting our fight for good that twists and struggles to find dominance in the soundscape. The final minute of this epic song is the most memorable, with an electric guitar and drums that feel commanding and uplifting. It's fleeting and short-lived, but it provides a sense that perhaps there is hope in this fight after all. While you're engrossed in this eight minutes of musical wonder, we've been running around bashing quill beasts, fallen, and zombies to bits, all while introducing us to the enemy classifications of beasts, demons, and undead. The various threats of this world, each with their own strategy. Quill beasts are often in pairs or triplets and attack from a range. The zombies trudge along slowly and appear almost harmless. An easy mistake to make, their health pool is large and their attacks brutal. The shouting and scampering fallen appear almost silly, but will fight in swarms, running from attacks in an effort to bait you into a larger group and overwhelm you through sheer numbers. These enemies can be dispatched with relative ease, but you'll need to be wary of your foe and keep a close eye on your health and potions. The game may pull a few punches while you find your footing, but it won't be that way for long. Exquisite design and gameplay highlights. With only a few kills under our belt, we will level up for the first time. The attribute points allow us to begin our journey of customizing a character. It is a system that is offered up with complete freedom, with only the initial existing point distributions acting as a guide of what to prioritize. The game knows full well that our initial choices will likely be poor, but we gain levels quickly enough to begin with, and as we learn more about the game, we can quickly compensate for poor early decisions. Each character's skill tree has three branches to choose from allowing for only a couple of choices on each branch. This limitation allows us to quickly choose something and try it out, potentially testing out all three branches very quickly in the beginning of the game as we amass levels. You must wait until level 6 before committing further down any one branch, encouraging the player to invest in a variety of skills. We get a sense of playstyle and compatibility. What skill or combination of would you like to pursue in the later game? We can easily scan the tree to choose what we would ultimately like to build towards. 
You'll likely never complete Hell difficulty with a character freewheeling it this hard, but your first playthrough will be much more about experimentation, learning, and appreciating the game's world more so than crafting the perfect fighting machine. My personal favorite aspect of Diablo 2 that is represented very well in the early stages is the nearly perfected loot system. I also especially enjoy these initial stages where every set of rags, crappy boots, and cloth helm feels like a massive improvement. Building up your character from scratch this way creates an early sense of excitement and reward that never fades throughout the game. You quickly learn the value in inspecting new gear, the intrigue of testing out combinations, improving on the old, and growing stronger with each new acquired piece. And that's even before you found your first magic item, which opens up a whole new world of seemingly endless possibilities. While it's much appreciated in the later game that you can have a book of Identify to not have to worry about this, there's something kind of exhilarating about not knowing exactly what you have right away. You either have to hope a scroll drops or run it back to town to be identified. There's a Schrodinger's Saber Cat here where you're not sure exactly what you're going to get. Who knows what that magical sword could be? It could even be a sword! The more is randomized, meaning that the early feeling of exploration and discovery is persistent even if it's your hundredth time starting the game. Unlike some of the later acts in the game, the layout here is relatively basic, making a full run of the area feasible and enjoyable. The maze-like jungles of the third act can often border on maddening, trying to find that tiny opening that you missed, but it fits that setting well, and the game has plenty of lead up to teach you the mechanics before introducing you to that. The first act also has the wise inclusion of the rope. If you would rather challenge yourself and run straight for the more difficult areas, all you have to do is book it down that dirt path. But if you stop and explore, in addition to satisfyingly chopping zombies in half, you'll find shrines, chests, and hidden stashes for additional bonuses. If you explore the moor for long enough, there is a subtle day and night cycle that will cascade the already dimly lit field into complete shadow. Your own dim light radius doesn't reach far, and there's little else to help you see, lending further to a grim, bloody, and gothic aesthetic that few games have ever recaptured. You're left to wonder what dangers creep around every corner. If you've been paying attention, perhaps your ears will prove more useful than your eyes. We've talked about the music, but the soundscape of this game is equally polished. The sounds of each enemy are distinct and quickly identifiable, often before you even see them. But even more important than that are the unique sounds representing the various loot drops. To this day, the sound of rings and amulets dropping are ingrained into my very being. Unlike a big piece of chest armor or some leather boots, we would rarely see an actual ring drop. It's only a tiny little pixel on the screen in the midst of a battle. But that clear, sharp sound that pierces through the cacophony of fighting alerts you to scour the area once the battle has been won. Throughout the entire game, this masterclass of sound design and foley is apparent, but it is introduced gradually during this opening section, allowing us to learn the beats and create early associations. Questing Our first proper quest is to step into the den of evil and cleanse it of its inhabitants. There are many foes here. We are greeted by rolling drums and deep keys that spell out doom, borrowing elements of the dungeon tracks of Diablo 1. We're fittingly introduced to this parallel to the first game's dungeons the first time we're indoors, riffing on these nostalgic connections for fans of the series. There are ethereal wisps, snappy drums, and creaky orchestrations. This is the first track in the game with a consistent urgency and presence. We are trapped with the weight of this evil surrounding us. While the fallen and zombies are still present, we are now introduced to a few new enemies. The fallen shaman and the gargantuan beast. The shaman provide an excellent introduction to interplay between enemies. Acting as a support, with the shaman consistently casting fireballs and raising fallen corpses back to life, we're led to understand that we need to prioritize. If we don't kill the shaman first, we could easily be overwhelmed by an infinite onslaught of fallen. And while the gargantuans themselves do not really introduce you to any new mechanics, they're strong and massive and provide a nice holy shit moment seeing these towering beasts try to crush us like mice. Your task in the den is simple, eliminate all of the monsters within. It is straightforward, but a relatively satisfying task. While it can be frustrating if you miss a corner with a few hidden enemies that you need to backtrack for, you feel like a powerhouse, storming through this cave using your new skills and loot, watching an enemy counter drop and the corpses pile up. At the end, we face off against our first unique enemy, Corpse Fire. It is likely the first unique we have encountered, introducing us to an extra powerful class of monsters, with attack and health boosts, elemental enhancements, special attributes, and beefed up minions. After basically looking at zombies hard enough that they fall in half, it's easy to be caught off guard by their strength. 
and if you're not careful, you might just experience your first death with the elemental effects. Poison and frost causing devastating combinations and hindrances. Your health will drop rapidly, and you'll be unable to move. This shock is so sudden, maybe we should pay closer attention to our resistance stats. The naming conventions, as well as the colors for the text and monster art, all work to highlight this is a powerful enemy, an early lesson that we need to be aware of for the rest of the game. Completing the den causes beams of light to shine through the roof, and an angelic chorus rises. From now on, when seen from above, the den of evil will be seen as simply cave. The rogues are safe for the moment. While it may not feel like much wandering the open plains, bashing the odd quill rat, we see here that we are directly affecting this world. We have caused a substantial change and dealt a meaningful blow to evil. Endless Potential Back at camp, we are rewarded with an extra stat point, a substantial reward. The quest log comes to a swirling completion, bringing a satisfying close to that chapter, tallying a victory in your journal to look back on with pride. We've probably already had 30 minutes romping around, killing everything we see. In the safety of camp, if we haven't taken the time to do so yet, now is the perfect opportunity to slow things down, take a breath, and evaluate your character. What is and isn't working for you? What feels conducive to your desired playstyle? How will you build towards that from here on out? Through this early part of the game, we're only really just scratching the surface. Maybe if you decided to ignore helpful Flavi and barreled on ahead, you've already had a taste of this. The Bloodmore really is just the tutorial, packaged as a full gaming experience. The game specifically laid out all those micro lessons, so you could learn the fundamentals of the game early on, allowing you to tackle the larger game without reading a wall of text. A member of the rogue sisterhood, Cassia, speaks of Andario, a formidable demoness we were introduced to through some of the first dialogue of the game, with the now corrupted Blood Raven raising the dead in the rogue graveyard. We have proven ourselves to a small degree and are building up a reputation to conquer greater evils. There is a shred of hope in the encampment, and we are more determined than ever to prove our worth. Don't worry, it won't take long to realize how easy the Bloodmore has been. There was some invisible hand holding at the beginning of the game, but that facade is completely broken now. Quickly upon entering the cold plains, you'll be slapped around by recurring unique monsters and their minions, fighting the unflinching corrupted rogues and relentless skeletons. The enemies are going to be much less spread out, individual groupings will be much larger, and if you ever try to shy away from fighting them, you're much more likely to wake up an additional pack of enemies. These large groupings of monsters and mixing up of types creates added challenges. The difficulty will only ramp up from here, but so will the rewards. Soon you'll be decking yourself out top to bottom in magic gear with a few rares, and maybe even a unique or set item if you're lucky. The game is excellent at feeding those to you just often enough to keep you on the hook looking for more. You'll begin to fine tune your skills and choose a few favorites to make deadly combos. Mowing down enemies in a bloody path of victory, specking your character to the beast they were always meant to be. These strong feelings of progression and power are what have kept people playing all these years. I know the title is claiming that just the beginning of the game is perfect, but really, nearly the entire damn game is crafted with this care and brilliance. It's just the beginning of the game is so vital to the overall experience, and few have done it better than Diablo 2. The Lord of Destruction expansion does nothing but add to the experience as well, but was left out of this video because it's largely content you won't experience in the early game. If you're going to pick it up for yourself, absolutely go for the expansion, but if for whatever reason you only have access to the base game, you're still going to enjoy it. It's just lacking a few added details that I think really helped the game stand the test of time. Diablo 2 continued Blizzard's pioneering of a genre, and it has remained the defining example that all other ARPGs are compared to since its release back in 2000. There have been many great ARPGs since then, but the conversation almost never comes up without Diablo 2 being mentioned in there somewhere. This enduring appeal is part of why many believed this game would be receiving the remastered treatment. Hopefully soon, right Blizzard? But even if we never see the day, many have worked continuously through the years to keep the game playable on almost any machine, with Blizzard and fans both working to preserve the enduring legacy of one of the greatest video games ever made. I saw this summarized very well in a post on Reddit, Diablo 2 is as simple as a game can be, yet still has everything you can ask for. And I think that's one of the most impressive things about this game. The barrier of entry is very low, the mechanics are simplistic yet effective, and everything comes together to be greater than the sum of its parts. Thank you guys so much for watching, I hope you agree with me, but if not, I'd love to hear why. Whether you never got into Diablo, or whether you think something else is better, I'm always open to other opinions. 
Thank you for taking the time to listen to me gush about a game that I love so much. I've been doing a Diablo 1 playthrough on the channel, with a bit of modding involved. I'll have a link to that in the end cards if you guys are curious about checking it out. Maybe someday we'll do a Diablo 2 one, I would really, really love to. I look very much forward to hearing from you guys. Thank you again for watching, and we'll see you again soon.